Achtung, Achtung, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk USA with me, Al Murray, James Holland, and of course, John McManus. Hello, John. Hey, Al, how's it going? I'm very good. Now, last time we, we spoke, I mean, this, this is a, this is part two, and maybe maybe it's part two of two, but, but who knows, because last time it was meant to be a self-contained episode about Douglas MacArthur, and we... Where did we did we even get to the outbreak of? No, I mean basically he kind of got off Corregidor, and that was about it. <laughs> That's about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which was pretty early in the story. I know. <laughs> yeah, but he hadn't, you know, he hadn't hadn't returned. No, nope. you know, we hadn't even got on to the kind of sort of island hopping up from Australia. We hadn't even got him to Australia barely. No, no. So, well, let's so let's pick up at you know his expulsion from the from the Philippines by the Japanese, and when he says, "I shall return," is that a does he ever imagine that that'll happen or, you know, cause it's quite, it's quite a thing to hang around your neck as albatrosses go, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it, well, here's the thing about it all. I mean, he's incredibly ambivalent uh, because he's been ordered out by the president of the United States, but he doesn't really want to abandon his people. So he's always going to have to wear that mantle, but he's got his wife and young son with him. So he does want them out. And he, he maintains once he gets to Australia, that he had just thought that he was going to be temporarily going there and that there'd be all these reinforcements waiting for him and that he could go right back in and help Wainwright out. And so that it was going to be just sort of a temporary exit, which I think is just selfistry. I've yeah. talked about this with uh, Chris Kolakowski, who yeah. was the director of the MacArthur Memorial, and he thinks MacArthur truly believed this in his own psych- psychology. I think it was all just sort of a put on. Um, it's all in how you interpret it. But I, I mean, I just don't know how anybody as intelligent as MacArthur could have actually believed that all these reinforcements would be raiding if, I mean, why would you have to leave the Philippines in the first place then? Why not just send them directly to the Philippines rather than yeah. have MacArthur go all the way to Australia? Yeah, fly your wife and kid out, you know. But he, he does mean every, I mean, when he says, says I will return, he, he absolutely damn well means that, doesn't he? I mean, by hook or by crook. You know, it might be a year, it might be two years, it might be three, whatever. For sure. Yeah, what he actually said, he said, uh, I came through and I shall return. And so, yeah, in that sense, he's committing, in his mind at least, the U.S. to coming back and liberating the Philippines. Yeah, Yeah. the, the, the exit from the Philippines has all these sort of layers to it. You know, you have the whole dynamic with FDR, who we knew very well because, uh, you know, MacArthur was chief of staff when FDR was president early on in his presidency. Yeah. Um, and they didn't get along particularly well. FDR had once said that uh, MacArthur was one of the two most dangerous men in the country uh, alongside <laughs> Huey Long, which was just fascinating to think about. So there's that. When did he say that, John? He says that um, I think when I think FDR said that when he was running for president in 1932, right. because it was in the context of the whole bonus marchers thing yeah. and yeah. MacArthur sending the troops out to, to crush the bonus marchers. And, yeah. uh, you know, so he, he said it after he, he got off the phone. He sort of mentioned it. FDR did to uh, yeah. to an aide. And uh, the aide is like, well, who's the who, who's the other one? And, you know, he says Huey Long and <laughs> Douglas MacArthur and, and you know, not not too far wrong in some respects. But, uh, yeah, so MacArthur has that baggage. He's got his, you know, his wife and young son with him. So there's that. And the other thing, too, and this is this isn't that well known, but it ought to be. He's taking money bonus payment from Manuel Quezon that comes out of the Philippines Treasury. And it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, so <laughs> that's seven point really? six million dollars in today's money uh, that he's getting paid to to leave the <laughs> when he leaves the Philippines. That's unbelievable. How can that be? Because it was a quote bonus for having worked for the Philippines, I guess for you know three, four, or five years, whatever it was, as he built up the Filipino armed forces. Uh, but really, it's quite shabby because he's on active yeah. duty in the U.S. Army, and and it's it's improper. So this goes all the way to the White oh. House, and the White House is kind of like. All right, we're not going to mess with this. And so not only at MacArthur, but several members of his staff got money too. Sutherland, uh, Dick Marshall. Yeah. And, and one other, I think it was Sidney Huff. And they literally just pocketed it. And yeah, kind of they just pocketed and- it. Yeah. Yeah. The, in fact, the, uh, the White House kind of steps aside while the deposit is made into MacArthur's bank. And, uh, you know, as I, mean, I calculated, astonishing. that was like $7.6 million worth of money in today's dollars. It was like half a million dollars back then. Isn't that crazy? I That's mean, like one of those sort of CEO severance things, isn't it? Where someone bank c- crashes a company and they get they get, get given a million dollars anyway. <laughs> I know, it's like the golden parachute. It's that and yeah. the Medal of Honor, too, by the way, yeah. it gets on top of it. Well, the, the other thing, too, that, that sort of closes the loop on the story is that, of course, Kazan gets out. 
and he goes yep. to the United States and um, and eventually encounters Eisenhower, whom he knew quite well, because Eisenhower was MacArthur's yeah. key aide in the Philippines. And yeah. Kazan offered money to Eisenhower, saying, you know, you worked for us for years. We're going to give you this money. And Eisenhower said, no, I, I don't think it'd be proper to take that money. And I've always See, felt I always, that right I always there. Loved there you are. Isn't that isn't that interesting? Because to me, right there, that's the difference in the two men. Um, yeah. MacArthur would take that money. Eisenhower would not. <laughs> but listen, just before we get on to his kind of on, onto the kind of military maneuvers and all the rest, I completely forgotten about the wife and the young son. I mean, it's quite late in the day for him, isn't it? Well, it, it is. He's had a previous marriage to Louise Cromwell. Right. Uh, and this this is a post World War One marriage. She's this New York socialite, and it's just a miserable marriage. Um, they didn't have any kids, but uh, she just. The dynamic was that she just loved to knock MacArthur down from his pedestal. And you know how he loved to be on a pedestal. And yeah. she just was. That was never going to work. It wasn't. And, and and the other thing, too, that's, I think, quite interesting about this in the larger context. You always hear, or I always did, at least, in, in studying the U.S. Army in World War II, uh, the standard thinking was, you know, if you had a divorce on your record, your career was done. Well, that was demonstrably false. Douglas MacArthur divorces Louise Cromwell. And obviously, his career is just fine. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Ridgway had three marriages. James yeah. Gavin had two marriages. You know, yeah. so all of them did quite fine. So it could happen. But uh, so in this case, you know, the, the Cromwell thing just wasn't going to work. Uh, so he divorces her and then he meets Gene, who is just absolutely his soulmate. Now, this is in the mid 1930s. So, yeah, he's yeah. in his mid 50s at that point. So when Arthur is born in 1938, what would that make MacArthur? 58, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right, Jim. He's he's definitely well along. Um, and yet he's got this young son. Is he still alive? Yeah, he is. Uh, and but he, from what I understand, and I don't know him and I don't know this beyond what I've heard from others that he, uh, he lives in New York city and that he's, that he changed his name and, and was not wanting to be associated with any of this. And, and I don't know oh, a right. lot more about him but, beyond wow. that. But Arthur MacArthur, right? That was his name. Yeah. Named after his grandfather. Yeah. So <laughs> right. Arthur MacArthur, which is such a, <laughs> it's an odd alliteration, isn't it? It's like, that's a great <laughs> name. I'd love to be called Arthur MacArthur. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, Jim, you, you might, I, I, I think anyway. So, I mean, that is, I mean, that is interesting because in the British army, your marital status is a, is a thing that's sort of supposedly closely examined and divorce is a bad move. And it was in the U S army too, but it didn't but mean it was for sure going to be a career killer depending on who yeah. you were. So it was unusual, but it could happen. And, and yeah. so you'll often hear this apocryphal story that, uh, you know, Ike wanted to hook up with Kay Summersby and that Marshall kind of collared him and said, you're not going to do that. You're going to stay with Mamie and all that. There's no evidence to prove that. Um, There's no so, evidence to support that he even had an, a, a physical relationship with Kay Summersby. Correct. Beyond Summerby, Summersby's own account, which I don't know how you could ever corroborate that. Uh, now, yeah. General Gavin says he... he you know, saw them affectionate one time. And I don't really know what that means. I mean, it could yeah. mean, I, I don't know. Could but it's, so, no, there isn't any conclusive evidence that Eisenhower had any kind of, you know, relationship with her. Who so, knows? So, but people have yeah. taken it so many different directions. It's, it's part of the fun, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, so go, go back to MacArthur. So he, he, he lives in the Philippines. He ends up in Australia. Which bit of Australia is he? Yeah, well, it's a, he, he goes through mostly the whole country because he, he gets uh, <laughs> he gets there by plane and then train and then, you know, goes down, obviously, to to, uh, to Sydney and Canberra and Melbourne and in Brisbane. You know, he's in all these spots and eventually, you know, has his headquarters, I think, in Brisbane. Yeah, because you know, that's the staging post for the Solomons as well and also for all those big islands, New Guinea and New Caledonia, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the other thing he had wanted as he left – uh, he had wanted Wainwright to do anything he could to continue fighting, and that meant guerrilla war. And so right, he's right. kind of hacked off at Wainwright for surrendering at Corregidor in May and um, and not, you know, dispersing his guys to go be guerrilla fighters. Well, how in the world were they going to do that on Corregidor? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you had guys on other islands, and some of them did become guerrilla fighters, but the Japanese are leaning on Wainwright saying, if you don't surrender everybody, and they're really worried about all these guys scattered to and fro. They say, if you don't surrender everybody, we're going to have reprisals on the POWs we have now. King and all yeah. those guys who had survived the Bataan Death March, you know, the month before in April. So Wainwright's in an impossible situation. But it's really, you, you also see the kind of the, the nasty side of MacArthur here, too, because um, the War Department wanted to confer a Medal of Honor upon Wainwright as the months unfold in 1942 and 43. Uh, MacArthur does everything he can to, to squash that. 
So uh, it's only later in 1945, you know, once Waynard is liberated and is so obviously a hero, for lack of a better term. I mean, just in terms of how he's comported himself, that MacArthur can't stand in the way of that. And then he kind of gets on board with it. And, <laughs> you know, uh, so Wainwright does get his Medal of Honor, but it's much later. God, how interesting. And why is why is MacArthur given the Medal of Honor for leaving the film? Yeah, see, so yeah, this is my opinion and my opinion only. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> As you know, as you guys know, but I mean, I don't want to denigrate MacArthur's valor. He's a courageous person and he comports himself on Corregidor very bravely. He loses 25 pounds, you know, so it's not like he's eating well or and he's no kid. Uh, So he's courageous, but there is no real act of valor we could point to to say, okay, this should be a Medal of Honor. It's really a political Medal of Honor in the sense that there's been this big cult of personality in the U.S. built up around MacArthur and about how, you know, great he's been and holding off the Japanese against this this over, you know, this onslaught and all this kind of stuff. So it really is kind of a morale booster for the country to recognize MacArthur in this sense. And um, and again, <laughs> Eisenhower later allegedly is offered a Medal of Honor for North Africa and says, supposedly, no, I don't think it's appropriate. I didn't really risk my life the way others did. And I once knew a man who got one for sitting in a hole in Corregidor. You know, so he takes the swipe at, uh, at <laughs> MacArthur. Um, but, I, you know, so MacArthur becomes one of only two father-son recipients of the Medal of Honor. Wow, right. You know, his his father, Arthur, had gotten her in the Civil War, as we, we discussed in the in the other episode, uh, but also the, the Roosevelt's, um, Teddy Roosevelt, right. the president, who got it for San Juan Hill. And then obviously, as you guys know, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. for Utah yeah. Beach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, we can argue about that one another time. But um, in, the Ameri- in, the Ameri- in the British Army, very often, you know, um, when things go badly, medals get doled out. So if you if you want to know when things have gone horribly wrong, it tends to be sort of cluster of Victoria crosses around it. <laughs> Rock's Drift, you know. <laughs> it, Rock, yeah, Rock's, Rock's Drift is probably the, you know, the absolute, yeah, right. the pinnacle of good news, bad news. Is that a thing that happens in the American in the American system? Do, do, do medals get doled out when things are going pear-shaped? Oh, most definitely, yeah. Um, and it, you really see that more in Vietnam than, right. than you do in World War II. Um, you certainly have a lot of DSCs in Vietnam or, or Silver Stars, shall we say, that others would, would feel maybe in the longer sweep shouldn't necessarily have been awarded that perhaps were there because of careerism too. Yeah, uh, right. that You had to have maybe you know some kind of decoration in order to move up so that there was some kind of institutional momentum for this. In World War II, um, sometimes you see it go the other way. <laughs> There's almost this kind of shame because, you know, I think relative to the courage, a lot of these uh, Phil American troops fought with, there probably should have been more decorations um, yeah. for, for 41 and 42. Uh, you do have a guy named Sandy Ninager who gets the Medal of Honor for basically going out and just hunting any Japanese he can, you know, during the fighting on Bataan, like in the middle of the front lines. And just he, he was a, uh, a uh, fresh out of West Point guy who had, he's a fascinating story. And he had written letters that they were really expressive that are in the, the West Point archives that I was able to, to really look at and, and get a sense of who this guy was. So you do have him, but you don't have many others. And I, I've always thought that they're, they're sort of overlooked. So you actually, you kind of see, you see it cut both ways. Sometimes when yeah. there's defeat, there's a sort of shame of, well, we're not going to reward this. And yeah. other times there's the kind of careerism of saying, okay, here's how we save face. <laughs> yeah. And John, one of, one of the things is you've got MacArthur leaving going, you know, I will return. And he's, you know, whatever you say about him, he's still got a huge amount of him and, and presence and standing and all the rest of it. You've got Ernest King also going, you know, I'm going to kind of make mm-hmm. it, you can say what you like, but I'm still making the specific priority. You've got a lot of heavyweights ganging up in favor of a specific heavy response. So, you know, I'm very interested by this kind of Germany first concept. It might be Germany first, but it's still, let's defeat the Japanese no. only marginally second and literally by a matter of a few degrees. Right. It, it, yeah. I mean, it's Germany first in name only in a way that first nine months or something. And, and public opinion is is kind of against that in, in some parts of the country. I mean, really, more people wanted to get after Japan. They, they were angry at the Japanese about Pearl Harbor. Uh, they were they wanted to avenge what was going on in the Philippines or help the troops in the Philippines um, instead of, say, sending lend lease stuff to the Soviets or whatever. Mm. There was a lot of pushback. And then and so one of the reasons why Roosevelt wants so badly to get U.S. troops involved somewhere in what we'll call the European war, you know, is because he doesn't want a bunch of um, Pacific first candidates getting elected in the 1942 congressional elections that will be able to kind of amend his his Germany first policy. So that's why Operation Torch happens from an American perspective, at least. Wow, I never knew that. I had never twigged that. 
in that mind, I mean, I mean you know, of course, you have the whole El Alamein thing, but the, the U.S. involvement and why that's all sort of rushed along, that's exactly what it's about. You know, because the other, the other sort of subplot to this is that you had the China lobby. And so, you know, you had long history of involvement. The China lobby is very strong as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. And it tends to be Republican. Uh, mm. So right there, that's a kind of built-in opponent for FDR and the Democrats. And they then are going to combine forces with some of the Asia firsters who MacArthur sort of represents uh, to kind of coalesce around that idea. And, it, you know, they can really point to it and say, well, now, look, our boys are fighting the Japanese right now. Right now, they need our help. We can't think of the abstract helping out Europe. You know, we need to help our guys here. And of course, Ernest King, for once, he would agree with MacArthur on the point. That, I mean, Ernest King hated MacArthur with a passion. Uh, but for once, he would agree with him because Ernest King, being obviously head of the Navy, is going to be thinking more Pacific first and sure. also worried about, you know, uh, the balance, the, the, the sort of Japanese favored balance of power you have in the wake of Pearl Harbor. So, yeah, you know, so you end up with a kind of compromise, as often happens. What, why, why does King hate MacArthur? King, King hates MacArthur uh, because he thinks that, uh, well, for, for a lot of reasons that th those who don't like MacArthur dis <laughs> just dislike him. He thinks he's pompous. He thinks he's self-important. He thinks he's megalomaniacal and egomaniacal. And, of course, he's right. But, you know, Ernest King, a lot could be said about him in that respect, yeah. too. Um, yeah. So I think yeah. in some ways it's like, man, this dude is too much like me. I don't like that. Um, yeah. But he also think he, he thought MacArthur was too presumptuous in wanting, you know, his own influence and power and control over resources in the Pacific when it really ought to be the Navy's war. And, you yeah. know, obviously you can understand that. I mean, obviously it's, it's a naval war to some extent. So he didn't. So what King wanted to make sure through the whole war is that MacArthur didn't get his hands on control of major fleets, uh, and so you end up, you know, with that kind of compromise of a split theater, which MacArthur rails against for the rest of his life, saying that violated the principle of command and all this. And he's right, but really, how could any one person control that whole theater? from the Aleutian Islands to the South Pacific to the Philippines, yeah, yeah. and then much less in, in Asia, you know, in China, Burma, India. But, but, yeah. but this is exactly what happens, isn't it? I mean, so you have Coral Sea, May 1942, then you've got uh, midway at the beginning of June, then you've got uh, Guadalcanal from kind of August through to February 1943. That, that's the kind of main event. But it's, it's after the fall of Guadalcanal uh, in favor of the Americans in, in February 1943. That's, okay, so now what? What do we do? And there is this split that you just alluded to, isn't it? Between mm -hmm. yeah. MacArthur's control, Nimitz's control, the South Pacific versus the kind of Central Pacific. But it's amazing how in the narrative, and this is one of the things that you've obviously spent a lot of time working on, John, in the narrative, it, it's still Marines, 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 U.S. Marine oh Corps, God, the yeah. Navy, the Navy, the Navy, <laughs> rather than the U.S. Army that actually plays a much larger part in terms of manpower on on the ground yeah but the, the army are the meat and the sandwich though aren't they is the thing they're the meat and the sandwich and they're most of the meal if we're thinking of a buffet yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're yeah they're eight tons yeah. of the meal the most <laughs> yeah pudding <laughs> absolutely too. so how does this come about what well, you know what, what, i mean macarthur's in brisbane there's lots of sort of toing and froing there's lots of kind of arguing about how the you know what what do we do how does this shape up what can we be achieved you know guadalcanal works very you know ultimately works out in favor of the americans they kind of get themselves together. It's a bit touch and go in the summer, late summer of 1942, but they kind of sort it all out. There's some heavy naval battles and there's some fierce fighting. Yeah. It comes, you know, and it's a massive turning point. Whichever way you look at it, you know, the Japanese know it. Everyone knows that this is the big, kind of the big change. But from that point onwards, the Americans in the Pacific are kind of, they're on the fight back. But, but how they does are. that, how does that strategy for the fight back take its form? And yeah. What part does, does MacArthur play in it? Because he's, he is just central to the whole thing. Isn't he? He's totally central. And, and he, in a way, symbolizes the prominent role of the army. Because the army does the vast majority of the fighting on the ground in the Pacific theater. And, and really does the plurality of the dying, too, even though it's a very deadly war for the Navy and the Marine Corps and all that. I don't want to disparage them, um, especially the Marine Corps. Incredible valor. But there just aren't many of them. And so you need... Aviation engineers, you need transportation people, quartermaster people, and obviously a lot of combat units. And so 
what the the sort of theater arrangement that that, are, that emerges is this compromise of saying, okay, well, MacArthur is going to control Southwest Pacific area, basically New Guinea all the way up to the Philippines, and he's going to have a lot of army resources, but not exclusively that. You know, a lot of army air forces and a lot of navy. And then we're going to have Nimitz doing the island hopping throughout much of the rest of the Pacific. And this is the Marshalls, Marianas, all the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. And the Gilberts. And, um, you know, but he also is going to be controlling a lot of army resources, too. Uh, and so he has a subordinate who's been totally forgotten by history, Lieutenant General Robert Richardson, mm. uh, who really is the kind of administrative guy controlling uh, and helping train a lot of these army troops that are going to be fighting in so many of these islands that we tend to associate with the Marines. But there are very few exclusively Marine Corps battles. Uh, there's Tarawa. There's maybe Cape Gloucester, maybe Iwo Jima, except that there's an army regimental combat team that fights there, too, and, and all that. But mostly it's shoulder to shoulder or the army actually doing the entirety of the fighting, depending yeah. on where we're talking about. So MacArthur somewhat symbolizes that. And he's the overall commander of that. He's commander in chief of that effort. Isn't he? Sort of, but, but, but yet he doesn't control all the army resources because yeah. he's got SWAPA Southwest Pacific area, but then Nimitz has his command. And yet Nimitz then has army forces under his command that MacArthur doesn't control. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a very quick break and then we'll come back. Cause I have a, I have a question about where we've got to just right there. Uh, we'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk USA. John, why is it that um, the Marine Corps, as far as everyone seems to think, w won the Battle of the Pacific? How has that happened? How has the historiography tilted in that direction? Because the, the program, for instance, TV show like The Pacific, for instance, that's that's inherited that storytelling idea it, it's not promulgated yeah. it, it's it's part of that tradition rather than like a, a break with the way the story had been told isn't it it is and in the pacific is is really good but it just reinforces that that myth yeah. that that the marines did the fighting in the pacific so why did this happen well the marine corps is really good at preserving its history at telling its story at selling itself in a way because it has to be it's small. It's similar to the army enough that politicians can come along and say, wait a minute, why do we have two ground oriented services here? Why don't we just fold this Marine Corps thing into the army? And of course, that's just heresy. You know, I mean, my God, any, say that at any Marine and, you you know, duck. I mean, yeah. so yeah. that's part of it is that the Marines definitely capture the public imagination, that idea of being volunteers, of being elite. Uh, of being committed warriors in that regard, which, which you know, most all Americans respect. Uh, yeah. But also, it's the same kind of concept you see, like, in Europe, where, you know, we're always talking about D-Day or Market Garden, the Bulge, or Berlin or something. And, you know, and that's the whole war. It's yeah. the same kind of concept. You can just sort of sort of flit about with looking at some of the Marine battles, and that sort of gets you through the Pacific without having to really engage in the whole damn slog. So who wants to talk about Buna when you can look at Tarawa, a three-day battle, and then you're done? Um, yeah. When you can look at Iwo Jima and the flag raising and say, oh, well, there's the drama there. Who wants to then think about this unholy slog uh, at places like Bougainville, you know, or right. in the Philippines, actually, because... Yeah. That's where the nexus of the fighting happens in those two campaigns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the time, they're not they're not being projected in the way that they've become. At the time, they're getting you know Bougainville is getting just as much coverage as Tarawa. Hey, yes and no. I mean, uh, I mean, Robert Sherrod makes Tarawa just absolutely famous and and rightfully so. Bougainville, when when the worst of the fighting happens there, which is in March 1944, not when the Marines first go in in November 1943, March 1944, the Japanese launch this incredibly wrongheaded uh, attempt to, to eliminate the American perimeter. And they're completely waxed yeah. by the 37th Infantry Division and the Americal Division primarily. There's not a lot of coverage of that. Yeah, and you wrote about that very, um, very vividly indeed in your last book. Yeah, it's it's quite a battle. It's some of the most ferocious fighting of the whole war, you know. And and it's also it's really interesting too beyond the combat level. It's really interesting because what you've got at Bougainville by then is a is a little American city in the mm. South Pacific. I mean, there's baseball games going on. There's yeah, ice yeah. plants. There's chapels um there's warehouses and you know an incredible port and and so you got all that little world and then way up in the in the hills and the bunkers is this ferocious fighting there's airfields of course too and all of it's initially meant to go get rabal which eventually of course they're going to bypass so 
So I, yeah, I think it's just a shame that sort of in the in the American public memory, the the Army's role gets overlooked because, and not just not just saying you know the Army should get its due, really not that, but I think it leads to a misunderstanding of what the war really was. Yeah, where where the center of gravity is and uh, and stuff in terms of effort too. Yeah, absolutely. John, the British famously have to undergo this kind of re- massive rethink after their defeats in Burma, and they're overrun in forty two. They bashed their heads against the brick wall in 43. Abortive chindit uh, nonsense. And I'll pin my flag to the mast how I feel about the chindit expeditions, right? What process does M- MacArthur initiate to reassess how you fight the Japanese, how you cope with the environment you're fighting them in? Because that's what the British have to, to grapple with the two things, you know, the, the Japanese and the jungle. Yeah. And, and this is asymmetric warfare, not symmetrical warfare. And, yeah. you know, we just need to kind of tear up everything we thought we knew from fighting yeah. in Europe and just clean slate, start again. Yeah. MacArthur must be involved in initiating that sort of re- regrouping of the thinking. What what happens? Yeah. MacArthur is really quite an innovator on some levels. And the, the way you see this happen is his uh, intuitive grasp, at, say, like by the end of 1942 and into 43, of the importance of air and sea power to what he wants to do, which, of course, his great mission is to go back to the Philippines. And defeating Japan is second, seemingly, almost in his mind yeah. some, somehow. But uh, he is able to consummate very good working relationships with his naval colleagues, with his Army Air Force's colleagues, most notably, of course, General Kenny. But where you see this this uh, this beginning of innovation start to come into play is the Buna battle in, uh, in Papua New Guinea in 1942. Yep. Uh, instead of trying to move these guys from Port Moresby across like the world's worst terrain to get to the North Coast, he's going to airlift them. And and that really begins a kind of a maturity in terms of aerial operations and air power that you're going to see expand into, you know, a lot of base hopping. It also makes his ground-based air quite deadly to some Japanese ships, too. The Battle of Bismarck Sea would be yeah. one example of that. On top of that, he understands amphibious warfare by 1944 very well. Uh, I would argue probably better than any other theater commander at that point. And so you do see that now in terms of the nuts and bolts of fighting on the ground. uh, MacArthur has to learn a lot from Buna. I mean, he's thinking like World War One trench kind of stuff initially. And when Eichelberger is there actually running the battle, it's very hard for him to press upon MacArthur. You can't move big formations. This is a jungle and swamp and so all you have are these little trails that they have covered with bunkers and so a big unit operation is is a company seriously yeah wow like 100 men that's it exactly if you're lucky and so how are you going to maneuver in that what are you going to do well, you know and you don't have much in terms of combined arms support anything like that at that point uh and so that's a learning experience for macarthur to understand what jungle fighting is going to be uh, and how to prepare his soldiers accordingly. Um, so he adjusts to that, I think, reasonably well over the next nine months. What he doesn't seem to grasp well enough is, as you move farther north, cave fighting, especially in the Philippines, and what yeah. it's going to mean in terms of, of uh, also jungle fighting, too, like on Luzon when the, when the Americans fight there in 1945. So MacArthur's fascinating because on some levels, he's, he's really an incredible innovator. On other levels, you say to yourself, boy, he was really out of touch because – his communiques would announce that a battle is basically over and it was just beginning. You know, things like that were really annoying to the troops, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so was there a sort of emphasis on patrolling and making sure you're in contact with the enemy so you know where they are? Because that's the big problem with the jungle is concealment, isn't it? It's basically you've no idea. You've no idea where the other side is. And so actually what the British figure out is you've got to patrol super vigorously and basically stay in contact with the enemy as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Because otherwise... Aggressive combat patrols are, are the order of the day, aren't they? Yeah, they'll yeah. vanish, you know, and you won't know where they right. are, and you could put an attack in on nothing. So so is that a big part of what, what goes on, which, is, which, after all, puts great responsibility on your lieutenants, on your platoon commanders? Mm-hmm. It is. It's a big part of what goes on in New Guinea, especially, because you're sort of yeah. inching your way across the north coast of New Guinea. Patrolling is a huge part of that. Uh, in the aftermath of the the, uh, the invasion of Los Negros in uh, February, March 1944, um, what happens, what I often compare it to, you know, when you're fighting the Japanese in these various places, islands or whatever, you don't have typically like a European-style 
end to the battle in which the German garrison surrenders at Cherbourg or, you know, whatever it is that we're like, okay, the battle's over. They've laid down their arms. It's, it's more like you've crushed the center of gravity in most of the resistance, but then there's other parts that you still have to clean up. It's like, it's like a shattered mirror. You've cleaned up all the big pieces, but there's all these little shards out there too. And so whether we're talking about New Guinea or Bougainville or Los Negros or Leyte or Luzon or whatever, that's typically how this works. Unless it's a tiny Island like Tar, where yeah. you've killed everybody. Could literally, you can actually kill everyone. Literally. Like Tarawa, only 17 Japanese surrender and everybody else is dead. In most places, though, it's not that dramatic. And so, yes, you do have to patrol constantly and or maintain your perimeters and be on the alert. And at this, then <laughs> the other thing, too, this intersects with the, the American mania for souvenir hunting and souvenir right. acquisition because you've got all sorts of people who then fill that vacuum in the battlefield They're like oh i want to find a japanese sword or i want to get this or that or the other thing and yet there's live japanese still there and these souvenir hunters are maybe they're sailors they're they're ground crewmen or something or, and they're not trained to, to deal with the japanese right in front of them and so the sad thing is there's a lot of tragic loss of life because of that Um, of guys just souvenir hunting on the battlefield and the combat troops trying to tell them, you got to be careful. This isn't where you belong. (laughs) Go away. (laughs) But John, just to go back to MacArthur, I mean, how do you, all the study you've made of this, and, you know, I kind of read Island Infernos last year about about the kind of the the army's campaign in 44. I mean, how does MacArthur progress? Because I remember when we were talking last time, we were saying, you know, the interesting thing about MacArthur is, you know, he's actually, his backstory is kind of a bit old fashioned. It's a bit old school. He's kind of had his day, and yet he emerges by 1945 as a kind of the ultra modern commander, you know, with the aviator shades and, you know, but also <laughs> not just in, in his look, but in the way he's operating, you know, harnessing air, land, and sea and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, he, he's got it, hasn't he? So he, he learns on the job, doesn't he? Oh, he absolutely does. Yeah. But that's impressively so. Impressively so, in the sense that by 1944, he is one of the world's leading practitioners of amphibious warfare. Without any question, Um, he also understands, as he kind of has to, that he can't just engage the Japanese everywhere, that he's got to bypass and he's got to surround and he's got to marginalize and isolate and all those good things. And there's lots of that going on, isn't there? There's enormous amounts of that going on. When the war ends, you have, you know, well into seven figures, the number of Japanese soldiers who have to be policed up and persuaded to surrender in the various islands and other portions in Asia, too. But yeah, MacArthur, you know, by, say, mid to late 1944, is a a master, too, at combined arms, at working with his naval colleagues, at uh, at coordinating air support, at lining up the logistics of all this, which, you know, is just absolutely staggering. He is really, you know, waging war at a very high level in the sense, but he's also quite fortunate in that he has tremendous subordinates. Admiral Daniel Barbet, who is just a, a first rate amphibious warfare specialist in the Navy, uh, Vice Admiral Tommy Kincaid, who is going to yeah, be yeah. the commander of the Seventh Fleet, who is, I mean, maybe Leyte Gulf isn't his finest moment, but he's still, he's a fine, fine naval officer, yeah. George Kenney, uh, yeah. and of course, his ground commanders, uh, Walter Berger and Robert Eichelberger, who are both very good, but especially Eichelberger, who is, I think, I would argue, probably pound for pound the best ground commander uh, in theater, and maybe in the war. Possibly on the on the American wow. side, he certainly is right up there. Uh, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, how little he's known? I mean, it's, oh, I know, and it's it's really a shame because I think a lot can be learned from him. We should do a whole thing on him, and we should do yeah, we should you know later down the line we should do whole episodes on these little these different islands because most people don't know about Boona and they don't know about Bougainville. And- and, and it's fascinating. You know, we were talking about Guadalcanal earlier. Boone and Guadalcanal are, are chapters out of the same book. They are really battles in the same campaign, especially from the Japanese point of view. And that's why the Japanese lose, because they're dispersing to deal with both of these crises. And, and I think that's not all that well known. That raises the question, what do the Japanese make of MacArthur? Yeah, <laughs> the Japanese are afraid of MacArthur on a, on a lot of levels because um, he just won't go away. I mean, he they um, <laughs> they were sort of foaming at the mouth to to capture him in 1942, which they knew would be a big propaganda coup, um, and that's why FDR wants him out primarily. So the Japanese are then after that fixated, of course, on the on the Pacific Fleet and and what's going to happen at Coral Sea and Midway and all this. But yeah. once the war gets going, once we're into the later part of 42, Buna and after. Uh, the Japanese see MacArthur as quite a formidable adversary, and and they're they're really worried about his ability 
to, to marshal all those resources that we were talking about, to coordinate the naval and air power, to pick his spots and where he can invade. But, but they also see him as uh, a vulnerable figure on some levels, too, because of his own egomania. <laughs> oh, which they know about. They know about a lot. Oh, yeah, they absolutely know about all that. Yeah, yeah. What, what they don't always know about is exactly what MacArthur's going to do next. Uh, right. Their intel isn't very good, and MacArthur's sometimes is. But, no, I mean, I certainly think it to kind of summarize their view is that they respect him, and, and they're wary of him. <laughs> and I guess the point where he can reinvade the Philippines, you know, First Leyte, then of course the big one, Luzon. Leyte is this kind of smaller island in the middle of the Philippines. Yeah, and he's and boy, a lot's happened for that to, to even become a possibility. Because not only, of course, operationally across the north coast of New Guinea. Well, you got the Battle of the Philippine Sea as well, haven't you? In the summer of forty-four, you've had that. Yeah, exactly. Which is which is so, it's interesting the way it. I mean, it's Battle of the Philippine Sea, but it's really more about what happens in the Marianas. But it but it also impacts going to the Philippines. You've had you had this big meeting in the summer of 1944 in, in July when FDR is running for his fourth term. And he comes out to, to Pearl Harbor to meet with MacArthur and Nimitz. And quite meaningfully, King is excluded from that. Uh, so it's interesting. King had been visiting and his plane is flying back. And, um, you know, it probably flies over the president's ship, which is U- USS Baltimore, which takes him to Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Uh, and so Leahy's part of this too. Admiral Leahy is, is basically yeah. like the first chief of staff a president ever had. And so they sit down and they chart the future course of the Pacific War. And we all know what MacArthur's agenda is. Um, I mean, it's all about getting to the Philippines. He's also, this is interesting too. It's like, he's also kind of hacked off that he has to be there because he's been called out of theater, you know, and, and summoned by FDR, whom he dislikes. And, uh, and, and also the other subplot to this, too, MacArthur had run against FDR yeah. in 43 yeah. and 44. And this isn't that well-known either, and it ought to be. This is a active-duty general, commander of, of a theater, running a Sub Rosa presidential campaign. That's extraordinary, isn't it? It is, and troubling. And unfortunately, it went nowhere. So that's all happened by now. And so then he's going <laughs> to sit down with FDR and Nimitz, who he's been really quite rude to at times in this war, uh, yeah. but is playing nice with him by now. Nimitz's role in this is, uh, I think, unappreciated, too. And Craig Simon's new book, I'd highly recommend to everybody. It's just, it's an amazing look at Nimitz and the war and overdue because he's so important and he's so patient and even keeled when it comes to dealing with MacArthur, who's sometimes like an adolescent child, uh, you know, in, in how he pushes back against the Navy and all this business. So so all of them you know, sit down to kind of decide on the future course of the war. MacArthur's angry about being there, but once he is there, he wants to make sure he's going to get back to the Philippines. Yeah. From a an allied perspective, what kind of ally is MacArthur to British um, imperial allies and dominions and effort? Because I know his name's Mud in Australia, really, isn't it? Where does that attitude? I mean, we're we're doing this uh, podcast on Zoom, and John's cracking a wry smile as I ask this question. <laughs> why why do things end up in such a parlous state with the Australians? And because it's the Australians, really, who've got yeah, that really beef is. with really have got beef with MacArthur. What's yeah. going on, and why is he? attitude to them what it is <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to preempt you there but it's such a thing that you know it's such an ambivalence and, and 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 me looking back on it now it makes some of it just makes me cringe like yeah what macarthur allowed to go on in his headquarters and among his staff officers and many people who served under him especially in 1942 the backbiting against the australians the the disrespect of a country that was really carrying the load of the Pacific War and the fighting on the ground in 42 and 43 on a lot of levels and was overstretched and had, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think per capita, the most part of it, the largest part of its population in uniform. And so MacArthur initially allows a culture to, to sort of metastasize in which there is this sort of division and disrespect and all that. Now, that starts to change once you get to the end at Buna. And one of the reasons is Eichelberger, because he forges productive relationships with Herring and other uh, Australian commanders. And, and the, the troops on the ground really like each other quite a bit. They yeah. don't like each other when they're competing for women in Australia. In combat, <laughs> they like each other a lot. So you've got that part of it. And MacArthur, though, too, I should say, you know, he gets along pretty well with Prime Minister Curtin. Uh, so to his credit, he does that and he starts to sort of get it in terms of respecting allies and working with them. But then he has to kind of leave them behind. And yes. this is the sort of 
bittersweet part of the war from an Australian perspective. MacArthur doesn't want the Australians really all that involved once he doesn't need them anymore, like in the 44, back to the Philippines, and then beyond to Japan. Maybe that's good for the Australians. Why though. is that? He's just, he just doesn't want them. He doesn't want to share the glory or what? It really isn't any disrespect to the Australian fighting formations for which he had great respect by then, but he wanted that level of operational control that he knew he would have with U.S. troops. And he was willing to have Australian naval presence. That was easy. Kincaid can deal with that. But if we're talking about Australian divisions being in there, then he has to deal with the blameys and herrings of the world and all yeah. that, and, and he doesn't want that. So he's he's yeah. had this whole sort of, this is so MacArthur again, surreptitious thing where he's created a whole army under their noses that he calls the Alamo Force, and actually that's Kruger's Sixth Army. Um, and the reason he's called it that, because he's worried that Australian three and four stars may decide, hey, I ought to be able to command that army because I have seniority over Eichelberger or, you know, whoever. Yeah. So he's played that little game with them. But then moving on, the Australians get the sort of consigned to the backwater of the war, which, again, is bittersweet. Maybe that's good that they're not in the middle of the bloodbath on, on Luzon or wherever. But also it's a little humiliating in yeah. the sense of just cleaning up at Bougainville or wherever. Yeah. And well, and it, and it makes, I mean, Australia's relationships are really complicated at this point, because after all, with the fall of Singapore, the British Empire's over. There's no point looking to London for, for security in that theatre anymore. So forget about it. But then MacArthur does what he does and treats Australia as a sort of very much second-class ally, and it puts noses out of joint. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. It does mean they don't get to participate in horrendous, in horrendous bloodbaths, <laughs> It's the thing of not feeling valued and all that sort of stuff. That, that having turned to a new ally in their back, as they see it, their backyard, they're then rejected by that ally. Is a sort of the politics is is rotten, isn't it? It's about bad, bad oh, politics. It absolutely is. It is, and it, there's this last meeting between Curtin and MacArthur, and it's kind of symbolic, you know, because MacArthur's moving on to uh, the Palaws and the Philippines. This is in 1944. Yep. Curtin is not well. And so it's probably it's the last time they're going to see each other. And it's very symbolic in that sense that, uh, that he's kind of leaving Australia behind physically yeah. and emotionally yeah. and mentally yeah. now that he doesn't need them. About a million Americans passed through or were stationed in Australia in the course of the war. That's a that's a very significant thing from an Australian point of view. This is a seminal moment in history. Mm. And so I think it's arguably when we look at it now, 80 years later, this is arguably the most successful alliance of all time or right up there. But still. It doesn't start very well, <laughs> no. in part because of MacArthur, but yeah. also, too, like so many things, MacArthur, there's other layers of saying, well, but on the other hand, he worked very well with Curtin. On the other hand, you know, he did eventually promote a culture with someone like Eichelberger, in which they fought well together on the ground or whatever. Um, so there's always that sort of otherness to it. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. So, some aspects of that just make me cringe, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just wrong on so many levels. <laughs> when when victory comes, though, it's very interesting because he makes sure Percival is present at, at the surrender, isn't he? Which I think is a very interesting touch because, after all, he could have been in that situation. He could have, if he'd if he'd gone into the bag in in Corregidor, he'd be in exactly Percival's shoes, wouldn't he? Really, absolutely, Percival and Wainwright, exactly, and as, exactly and Wainwright, and, and as a bigger figure. In that situation. So it's very striking that at the surrender, that's what he makes sure happens, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, one, one of MacArthur's great strengths is he, he's got such a grasp of symbols, symbolism mm. um, and, and what that means. He, he really understood that uh, he's he's almost, uh, you know, savant level in terms of image and and understanding how that means important things in the modern world. And so having Percival included in the USS Missouri yeah proceedings and Wainwright standing right behind him. I mean, he, he grasps exactly what that'll mean that just their presence. Well, it's interesting, John, because Al and I have just been talking about image and yeah. the fact that Mark Clark gets criticized for, you know, only having photographs taken on his left hand side and all the rest of it. But actually, you know, if that if that ultimately helps if Army get profile in the US and helps the Allied war effort in the US, who's to complain? I mean, but it is a, a right. war of Film footage and news reporters and Ernie Pyle. I mean, it'd, it'd be like a general being on TikTok now, wouldn't it? I mean, the thing is, is, this is these are new media, brand new media. Radio, radio, absolutely brand new in in the US and the UK. You know, the BBC's only 
10 years old. I can't remember the BBC setup, but you get my, you get my point. Yeah, right. That smart guys are savvy to this. Th- there's a new age of, of mass media and the democratic age in particular. Cause after yeah. all, the Nazis are often credited with the fact that they use media in a, you know, in a mod, in a modern and a new way. Well, everyone's at it actually. You could argue that the Allies use it far more successfully and it's part of how they win because they mobilize their own population incredibly successfully to that end. You, and so why wouldn't a general? With any brains, have uh, be completely in touch with using image, using iconography, understanding this form of mass communication. And after all, the, having Wainwright and Percival there is, is also that's symbolic to the Japanese too, isn't it? It's a renouncement of their way of doing things. There is no dishonor in their having been captured, and the dishonor is in their defeat rather than anything else. So he's yep. he's playing to both to the home and the enemy audience at the same time, isn't it? It's, yeah, I mean, it's incredibly is. clever. And it and it, it sells redemption too, that there can be captivity yeah. and, and and redemption yeah. and there can be then for the Japanese too. Yeah. yeah. And and yeah. the last thing, you know, the image. I mean, just MacArthur's look alone tells you how he grasps image. Uh, the, yep. the designer sunglasses, the specially made cap. Yeah, and the, the waiting ashore on Leyte, yeah. you know, off the beach and all the rest of it. And, yeah. you know, he has yeah. returned. He's wading through the water. Yeah, with a the stern look on his face. But am I right in thinking even in the First World War, he wore a cap that he'd had modified? He, he did. didn't wear a standard cap. Yeah, right. Exactly. He, he was very different looking from everybody else in World War One as well as a brigade commander and as the chief of staff. Uh, the yeah. 42nd Division, and he had a walking stick, too, which yeah. wasn't unusual for officers. But, uh, right. you know, like MacArthur, he really made it his own. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> he is amazing. I'm conscious that, you know, we haven't we still haven't talked about, you know, the end of the we talked about the end of the war, but we haven't talked about him afterwards and Japan and all the rest of it. Maybe that's for another day. Oh, that's big time. That's so important. And, and the, the campaign in 44, 45, especially Manila. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll do a MacArthur Revisited. Once once these have gone out, we've had a bit of feedback and people maybe have the questions to toss in. Yeah, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. That, that yeah. would, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's yeah, maybe definitely. the way to go. Good idea. Okay, well, as ever, John, an absolute pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye. Cheerio. See you.